Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Bill of Rights Institute's Close Reads. We're really glad you're here. My name is Kirk Higgins, and for those of you who are new to this program or our channel, um, every week we take a look at a different uh, primary source or Supreme Court case from American history uh, and unpack it for some big ideas and big questions that can help us dig into it and, and find some interesting themes. Um, so this week, we're going to be looking at the uh, case of Wisconsin v. Yoder, which was decided in 1972. Um, and to help me with unpacking this case, I'm fortunate to be joined by my colleague, Tony Williams. Welcome, Tony. Kirk, thank you. I'm really excited to be on, talk about this primary source, and also talk about how it relates to our Homer Kelp video. That'll be great. Absolutely. And thanks for mentioning that, Tony. Um, we have a Homer Kelp video um, about this case coming out this week. So um, if you have a chance to take a look, um, it goes through a summary of the case, kind of talks through the decision, some of the things that Tony and I are gonna be talking about here, um, but in a little bit more detail as far as the story of the case goes. So if you have any additional questions, please um, check it out. We'll be sure to link it here. Um, and so just to dive into the case, Tony, this is a, this is a case that really talks about religious liberty, um, which I know is something that you've thought a lot about and talked and, and written about, um, written a couple of books about this topic in general. Um, and it's one I think that's a perennial question um, in our nation. And I wonder if we could just kick this off by you first kind of explaining, you know, what is religious liberty when we say that phrase? What are we talking about? Um, and second, um, why is it this perennial question? Why is it that we seemingly constantly have these questions about sort of how to balance religious liberty? Right. Well, uh, you know, the American founding really uh, does something very transformational in world history. Uh, it creates the idea that your right of conscience and your right of worship, what, what we'll call religious liberty, uh, is, a, is an inalienable right. It, it's essential to, to each person uh, as a matter of their sort of freedom of, of thought and belief. Uh, we know that religion and, and other ideas are, are, are really integral to, to individual rights. Uh, and so, you know, the Americans developed this idea that, that it's a natural right, no longer just mere toleration, right? It's not gonna be tolerated by the state, the government, or, or by your fellow citizens, but rather enjoyed as a right. And, and really all the founders, um, you know, agreed on this. It's not that just some of them and we're cherry picking, you know, the, the founders really believed in this ideal. But it's been a perennial question. Uh, and I think uh, the most simple reason why is because, you know, oftentimes, you know, some of these essential rights, you know, bump up against other rights uh, that are out there or uh, other, you know, sort of compelling government interests. Uh, and, and these can be no less important, for example. Um, uh, you know, a brief example today uh, of, the, of this conflict might be, you know, we have individual liberty to kind of go about our day, uh, but there's also, you know, recent pandemic and, and public health crisis in which, you know, the the state governments, local governments had, had a compelling interest in terms of public health, in terms of requiring citizens to wear a mask or to socially distance from each other. Uh, and so these two things can often be intention. Uh, and, and we've seen that in our society. Great, well, let's take a look at the case. And I think we'll definitely come back to this topic here as we go through it. So, Tony, I think that that this idea of conscience um, and, and religious belief is really interesting because, like you said, it's kind of grappling with where this balance lies. And I think that's the big question of this case, um, which is how do we balance this idea of religious liberty, our own personal beliefs, um, whatever they may be, in the interest of the government? Um, and, and finding that appropriate balance, I mean, is something we'll see directly in um, the excerpts from the case that we'll read today. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through the entire decision, but we'll look at a few, a few snippets. But it seems like that balance is something the Supreme Court has very much on their minds because as the law is interpreted, it seems these kinds of things are, it's hard to write a perfect law that in all cases and all times is gonna be exactly what you need it to be. And, and here you have um, the case of a state being interested in, in having its citizenry educated, um, making that compulsory, and then you have a religious group who says, well, in fact, that conflicts with our beliefs. Right. I mean, I mean, the founders themselves, this, this is a perennial question, right? The founders themselves believe that an educated citizenry, an enlightened citizenry, 
uh, was really important for self-government, for Republican self-government to survive, right? So, so that's a really important, compelling state interest. And the government does have police power, state governments, uh, over health, safety, welfare, education of its citizens. Um, and yet, on the other hand, you know, we've already talked about religious liberty being an inalienable natural right. And so that's really important, too, for the individual and for, for religious communities. So you see this tension there. Right. And, and it's not always necessarily easy to resolve that tension of two uh, important principles at stake. Absolutely. And so just to get right into the case. So we have this. This takes place in the state of Wisconsin. Um, in I believe the case, uh, I believe that the actual case began in the 1960s, but was decided by the Supreme Court um, in 1972. And you have um, members of the Amish community of two different Amish communities. Um, uh, having a concern because they felt that their, they did not want their children to continue in the state schools um, all the way up until the state of Wisconsin, I believe, was requiring them to be in school till they were 18 is that, or 16, rather. 16, right. right. 16. Um, is that, so that's what brought about the case? Right. And, and that's the school requirement was the law. And, and it's a reasonable law, right? We want an educated citizenry. And, and the idea was that students uh, were required by state law to stay in school until they were 16. But this ran up against some religious beliefs as we'll talk about. Right, and I think the, the members of the Amish community were saying, look, we're still educating our children. We just would like them to have a more vocational or, or sort of hands-on education within the Amish community as opposed to them going to um, one of the public schools or, or whatever other school was deemed appropriate by the state of Wisconsin. Right. And, and, and they said, you know, the, the education of these children in terms of their morals and in terms of their vocational education for the skills they'll need to survive and to thrive uh, in our community uh, will be attended to. You know, they will be taught uh, those things. And so they're saying uh, we don't necessarily need them to go to a public high school and, and learn physics or chemistry or calculus or, or what have you. Uh, we will continue with their education, but we really value what, what came before that, but we only wanted to go up to eighth grade. Great, and so the question goes through the, the, the law system in the state of Wisconsin, goes up to the state of the state of Wisconsin Supreme Court, um, and then eventually gets appealed up to the um, United States Supreme Court um, with kind of this question at the heart of it, which we've been talking about, which is did, does Wisconsin's requirement that all parents send their children to school at least until the age of 16 violate the First Amendment by criminalizing the conduct of parents who refuse to send their children to school for religious reasons. Um, so I like to highlight this question because I think it's, it's interesting. Again, we're talking about this big constitutional question of like, okay, what is, what is it that we're balancing between personal religious belief and the state's interest? Um, and then specifically here, we're looking at, okay, state of Wisconsin is saying, Wisconsin is saying kids got to go till 16. And if the kids don't go, then the parents are personally responsible. And then it's the parents who are saying, well, my religious base objects to that law. And so therefore that's, that's the heart of the tension. That's kind of the rubber meeting the road, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and this really nicely lays out uh, this, this main tension, right? In the case between the, the state's very legitimate interest in, in education and the parents and the religious communities very legitimate and compelling interest in, in their re religious liberty. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see how the court decides. Absolutely, and so the court did decide um, unanimously for Yoder with a, with a partial dissent, which is interesting, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, and what it came down to was this First Amendment, we haven't talked about the Bill of Rights, we're the Bill of Rights Institute, but, uh, but this First Amendment uh, is, is really important. And what they said was that, it, and, and we'll get into their exact language, but that the free exercise clause was what was at question here. Um, I wonder, Tony, if you could help me just unpack a little bit. So we've got this free exercise clause, then we have the establishment clause. One is about sort of the establishment of religion and that the state can't establish a state religion. And then exercise is about a personal exercising of that religious faith. Is that kind of the difference between the two or how, how, would, you, how would you set up that difference? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so the first amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. 
kind of controversial what that exactly means, but it essentially means that, that, that the national government could not set up an official church, right? Uh, and um, this has been incorporated uh, into uh, the states and, and local governments as well. Uh, and the free exercise clause really goes to the heart of that religious liberty, that, that you know, your, your basic religious beliefs uh, and the exercise of them and your worship uh, as well uh, cannot be impinged upon by the state, right? That, that the state should take no cognizance of how you practice your religion or your, your private religious beliefs. Great, and that's exactly what they found. And so here we have a one um, part of Justice Warren Berger's um, majority opinion um, in this particular case. Um, and he uses, you know, much of your wording, but, but what he's really arguing here, uh, what I found interesting here was you said a compelling interest earlier on. You said that there's a compelling, that there's a serious interest that the state has. The state is serious about education. It's very clear why that's being established. And there's a legitimate belief on behalf of the religious community. Um, and Justice Warren Berger, I think he's building up to this free exercise argument. Um, but he begins by underlining what you had said earlier, Tony, which is this is this is a dearly held belief, and the Amish community is is putting forth a its own style of education that is still working to do that within this belief framework, or at least that's how I read it. Is that close to kind of how you saw this passage? Yeah, I think that's correct, and and I think what what Berger is acknowledging is that look, all of these young people uh, in this community uh, re presumably received uh, you know basic literacy and and they learned basic math skills and they took some social studies courses so they learned about civics and history and and took science classes as well and and so they did receive the a good basic education uh, that would make them responsible. Uh, and educated uh, citizens, and, and that their specific education uh, in, in the vocations and morals and so forth of the Amish community would continue, uh, but, but that they had been educated up to that point. Right, so the state, you know, has a compelling interest that may, is maintained, but after the eighth grade, in this case, they are saying that's been satisfied. What the state is concerned about by eighth grade has been satisfied, and then therefore, um, free exercise becomes the thing that outweighs that state interest. Right, and and another two years. I think they say also. They say another two years will not really make that much of a difference uh, in terms of saying, well, you know, they were prepared to be good citizens now that they're sixteen, but not with that education up to fourteen. You know, the court kind of says, well, it's it's only a matter of a few years anyway. Right. Yeah. And I think and I think that balance that you're talking about, and I, I do think we have that in another um, segment here in a little bit. But I think that balance that you're talking about is, again, what what Berger goes on, Justice Berger goes on to say here, which is, look, this is a balance. Right. We're, there's there's no there's no perfect point at which we're going to say, well, at this, you know, this is now the line whereby we're saying this is perfectly balanced. But they're saying through sign of the, the, this um, dialogue between government and the citizenry. We are working to find where that balance is best in place. Um, and, you know, he says here, he quotes that balance. He says, a state's interest in universal education, however highly we rank it, is not totally free from a balancing process when it impinges upon, when it impinges on fundamental rights and interests, such as those specifically protected by the free exercise clause of the First Amendment and the traditional interests of parents with respect to the religious upbringing of their children, so long as they, in the words of Pierce versus Society of Sisters, prepared them for additional obligations. So again, I think this is underlining a few things we've mentioned. It's the seriousness with which the Amish are holding these beliefs, that, that it, it is a seriously held religious belief, um, that it is something that now is in balance with the state's interest because we have that um, right of free exercise in the constitution. And the state, though it does have a right in this case, you know, it's not always going to outweigh that, that the state's interest in education doesn't always and everywhere outweigh the interest of um, the individual when it comes to free exercise. Right. You know, I really like this decision, right? Because it acknowledges that, that there's compelling interest on each side, 
right? Uh, and and acknowledges the the state's interest in education, which which we believe at the Bill of Rights Institute, right? Uh, and, and an educated citizenry. But the court's majority here does default towards protecting religious liberty, right? And, and it acknowledges that by calling it the, the fundamental right of religious liberty, what the, the founders might have used the word, you know, the natural right uh, of freedom of conscience. Uh, and, you know, Washington said this a lot in his first administration, uh, in several letters to many, many different denominations uh, of Christianity and Judaism. And he said, you have a natural right to freedom of conscience. And he also said, uh, we only ask that you comport yourselves as good citizens, right? Uh, and so the court seems to be, you know, very much in line with the founders thinking uh, in this case, you know, and I, I really like the way they default to protecting religious liberty. Yeah, I mean, those personally held beliefs are protected within the structure of the Constitution for a reason. And for the state to violate that, which, again, at times, there's a compelling interest for the state to violate um, that right. Um, but it has to be clearly articulated. And here, I think you see the court really wrestling with that. Um, right. and for example, they had said, you know, we don't want our kids to go to school at all and just be right. literate or, or yeah. we're practicing you know, I don't know, some kind of human sacrifice or something kind of outrageous that would violate uh, all sorts of rights, uh, you know, then the state would have a compelling interest to say, well, you don't have the, the, the freedom to do that uh, under your religion. So, so there can be limits, right? Uh, reasonable limits uh, on this. And, and yet, you know, barring all that kind of extreme examples, um, you know, the default is to protect religious liberty. Yeah, and I think you foreshadowed uh, Justice Byron White's uh, concurring opinion here. And concurring opinions are always interesting to me because it's concurring opinions, as I understand them, are, look, I'm agreeing with the majority, but I just want to really emphasize this point. And I think the point that Byron White is emphasizing here is, look, we found in favor of this religious group in this case for these reasons. But that does not mean that any religious group or that any group, whatever that may be, has a compelling interest to push back against the state's interest in education for any reason. Um, or at least that's how I read these two passages, you know, him talking about the balancing. Here's where the, the line you were mentioning earlier about the two additional years. Look, you know, two additional years isn't going to make that much of a difference um, at once you reach eighth grade. Um, but uh, and and emphasizing again too the sincerity of the Amish religious policy here is uncontested saying, look, it's clear that this is you know, that this is a sincerely held belief that these two years aren't gonna make a difference. And so in this case, it is clear that this balance is here, but it seems to me he's also saying, but not all, I mean, the, the line is um, that it outweighs the importance of the um, conceitedly sincere Amish religious practices to the survival of that sect, right? Um, but it seems to me implied within that is, but not always, right? This is a, this is an open, conversation. We're making this decision. It's very clear here why we're making it, but this is still a debate that's going to continue. All right. You know, I think White is saying, look, it, it's it's a good law for a state to decide that, you know, it's it's young people need to stay in school until they're 16, right? Or, or roughly 10th, 10th, 11th grade. You know, that that's otherwise a good rule. And, and if you're going to break with that, you know, there needs to be a compelling reason why, and, and you need to persuade us uh, that your beliefs uh, would, would truly be sort of in, endangered, uh, you know, by, by, um, by attending. Uh, and so uh, you, you, need to, you need to convince us. Uh, and, and in this case, the Amish did. Yeah, and, and I think it did, again, unanimously, but there was this partial dissent. And I find this partial dissent to be really interesting because I think it gets to the heart of this question about religious belief because um, Justice William Douglas, again, finds for Yoder, um, but calls a asks a question, essentially is how I look at it, about whose religious faith we ought to be considering here. So earlier, I think it's interesting um, just to highlight again, it was Wisconsin's law was holding parents accountable for ensuring their children were in school, right? So it's clear that the parents then have, um, are, are the ones that are 
I guess, affected by the law in a certain sense. But what Douglas says here, Justice Douglas says here is, um, but what about the faith of the children who are in question here, which is a really interesting one. Um, you know, he says the court's analysis assumes that the only interests at stake in the case are those of the Amish parents on the one hand and those of the state on the other. The difficulty with this approach is that despite the court's claim, the parents are seeking to vindicate not only their own free exercise claims, but also those of their high school age children. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I, I find that question compelling. It, it gets tricky, right? Because there's a, there's a stage at which parents are, or children are, you know, sort of under their parents' protection, you know, I guess in tax law, we would call them dependents, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but, it's, but it's this different relationship. When, when a child is fully recognized by the state as being their own citizen and those rights change, and there's lots of cases about that too, um, but I think it's an interesting question that that Justice Douglas points out here. You know, I, I think it's interesting, and, and I'm sympathetic to the idea that he wants to sort of empower children uh, and and give them a voice, and and maybe it's possible that they wanted to stay in school. I, I'm not sure about that, but uh, you know, but but so I am sympathetic to that. On uh, yet on the other hand, I I, I do strongly think that um, you know I I think it's somewhat of a red herring uh, in in the sense that this is sort of distracting from the 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 compelling sort of uh, tension here. You know, I, I think the right tension is between the state law and and the religious beliefs of this community uh, and of these parents and and and, and of the family. Um, I, I think what Douglas is doing here is setting up a bit of an adversarial relationship between the parents and the children. And and I guess you know, I'm, I'm a little uh, less willing to say that the, uh, you know, the government should, you know, have a compelling interest in, in intruding in that relationship and that, in that family relationship. And, uh, you know, whether, you know, the, the parents, you know, have, have a lot of influence over their children. I mean, I, I don't think that's really something that, that the state government should, should be taking cognizance of. Uh, I, I think that they have a compelling interest in, in education and in schools and, and in educated citizenry. But, but otherwise, I think that, that this, the, the government and, and really Douglas here should not be setting up that adversarial relationship between parents and children. And with that, it brings us back to our big question here, right? So, I mean, I think, I think what you're pointing out too, I think is even a part of this balancing act, but fundamentally we're back at this big question that was asked in this case, which is how do we balance religious liberty with government interest? And here in Wisconsin v. Yoder, um, we've, they found that uh, how you balance that is looking at the sincerity of belief. In this case, if they're saying their children, you know, are going to school at the eighth grade, but after eighth grade, they're uncomfortable with it. In that case, the religious liberty is out or the free exercise of that religious faith is outweighing government interest because much of that government interest is satisfied um, and the religious, the free exercise that those individuals want to um, exercise, uh, sorry for the repeated word, but, but that, is, um, that is of value and of interest and that should outweigh the state's interest in this case. Right, and and this is just one of many cases dealing with with uh, you know the the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. I mean, you know, we're dealing with with prayer in schools and Bible reading in schools, and whether state state government should fund Catholic schools or the the textbooks or even the buses the students ride on. Uh, later on, we'll see court cases dealing with you know, uh, Christmas and Hanukkah displays in public or prayer at, at graduation or, or at football games. I mean, these are just kind of perennial questions that, that the court's uh, dealing with in terms of, you know, the, the state interests uh, and, and the interests of, of religious communities. Yeah, and, and more cases on the horizon too, as questions about whether or not um, employers are providing insurance and whether that oh, those insurance policies are violating certain aspects of religious faith. And um, I mean, it, it's, it's an extremely complicated question and one that I am confident that the court will be continuing to wrestle with um, so long as the court's in existence. <laughs> so question um, is not going away. I can absolutely, assure. absolutely.
Well, Tony, thank you so much for joining me. This was great walking through this case um, with you and thank all of you for tuning in. Um, we release videos, um, our primary source close reads um, come out uh, every other week, but we've got new videos coming out all the time. Um, and as I mentioned, one of those will be our homework help video on this case in particular, which gets even more into the story of the case and how it came about um, and its, its path to the Supreme Court, um, as well as picking apart the decision a little bit more. So I hope you'll check out um, that video. Um, remember to like and subscribe so you can find out when all of our content's coming out. Um, not only do we do these informative videos, but we also have um, AP prep videos if you're um, getting ready for your AP government exam or your AP US history exam. Um, and the Bill of Rights Institute's got all kinds of stuff going on all the time too. So do stay in touch. Um, you can reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, um, and we'll hope to see you next time.